defense would call Dr. Joseph Wood. Uh, yes, my name is Joseph Chong Sang Wu, and I am a medical doctor. And uh, where is your uh, practice? Uh, my practice is located in Newport Beach, California. And is there an area that you specialize in? I specialize in the area of neuropsychiatry and neuroimaging uh, related to neuropsychiatry. Can you tell the jury uh, a little bit, uh, before I get into the specifics of that occupation, a little bit about your educational background? Yes, I did my pre-medical education at Stanford University. I graduated from there with honors in 1978. I then went to medical school at the University of California, Irvine. I obtained my MD in 1982. After that, I did a residency in psychiatry, which I also completed with honors in 1986. After that, I did a two-year fellowship in PET and MRI brain imaging, which I also completed at the University of California in 1988. Since that time, I served on the faculty at the University of California, Irvine uh, for 30 years uh, as a professor, and then I retired uh, two years ago, but I am still what they call a <laughs> professor emeritus, which means I still teach and do research. Okay. And um, uh, have you, t well first, what is your specialty of neuropsychiatry? What, to tell the jury if you would what that means. Well, neuropsychiatry is the subdivision of psychiatry, which is especially interested in the relationship of how the brain uh, affects uh, emotion and cognition, and how does a uh, uh, the brain structure, the brain function affects these things. And so it, uh, it's uh, very interesting in looking at how uh, brain damage in particular might result in uh, impairments and uh, things like impulse regulations. Have you, uh, in, in, uh, prior to today, testified as an expert in the field, in, in court, uh, as, as in the field of neuropsychiatry? Uh, yes, I've testified on probably <clears throat> uh, at least a, a couple hundred occasions. Your Honor, at this time, I, I don't know if the state uh, wishes to more die. I would offer Dr. Wu as an expert in the field of neuropsychiatry. Any questions? Not at this time, Your Okay, thank you. Uh, have you testified when you've testified as an expert in the field of neuropsychiatry? Uh, has that testimony, at least in part, been in interpreting PET scans and MRIs of the brain? Uh, yes, that's been the primary topic of my testimonies um, when I have been called as a witness. Can you tell the jury uh, what those tests are and what they involve, the PET scan of the brain and the MRI? Well, PET scan of the brain stands for positron emission tomography. And PET scans of the brain basically allow a physician or scientist to look at brain function. The way it looks at brain function is that we look at a form of radioactive sugar. Sugar is a main fuel for the brain. So sugar is like gasoline for the engine of a car. So when you have neurons in the brain that are firing, it needs sugar. And so if we use a form of radioactive sugar, we can see how much sugar is being consumed in different parts of the brain. This tells us how much the neurons are firing in that part of the brain. We can then convert the amount of sugar that's being consumed into a color. And so we use a color scale. So the areas of the brain that are consuming a lot of sugar are colored hot colors like red. And areas of the brain that are consuming low amounts of sugar are colored cool colors like blue. 
and then we can look at a gradation, uh, uh, like a rainbow scale, red, yellow, violet, green, blue, to represent the varying degrees of sugar metabolism in the brain. And, uh, and so uh, that is what PET scans are. And uh, PET scans are very useful for looking at uh, function of the brain because there are many disorders of the brain where the structure of the brain may appear intact but the function of the brain is not working correctly. You can actually, for example, take a cadaver and get a normal structural MRI or normal structural CT scan of the brain. So if you look at the CT scan or an MRI scan of a cadaver, it might appear perfectly normal. Uh, but in fact, they, uh, if you were to try and get a PET scan of a cadaver, you would get a blank screen because there's no sugar being consumed. So this is one example of how functional brain imaging is superior to structural brain imaging for looking at, at some types of neurological disorders. And the same thing is true with a comatose patient. You can take a patient who's lying in a medical coma, and you can get, in some cases, a normal CT or normal MRI scan because the structure of the brain is perfectly normal. But if you were to try and get a PET scan of a person who's in a coma, instead of getting an entirely blank screen like you would with a cadaver, you would get a scan that is very blue, very low sugar metabolism because there's a minimal amount of sugar being consumed in a comatose patient's brain. Uh, and so again, this would tell you uh, something that you can't derive from structural imaging. And so those are some examples of how functional imaging can be superior to structural imaging. And, and it turns out it's not just for death or coma, but scientists and clinicians have used PET scans to study many different other disorders, including Alzheimer's dementia. And so for example, with Alzheimer's dementia, you can see decreases in sugar metabolism in this part of the brain back here, even though you may not be able to see any detectable difference on an MRI CT scan in the case of early dementia, but you can see uh, sugar metabolism showing drops in this area of the brain. And the same thing is true with traumatic brain injuries. With traumatic brain injuries, there have been dozens of articles that have been published <clears throat> that show that uh, you can detect differences in sugar metabolism with patients with traumatic brain injury, even though you have a normal structural MRI scan. So that's the first type, uh, and that's one type of scan, a PET scan. Uh, the second type of scan that I'll be discussing is an MRI scan. And MRI scans have what we call different kinds of sequences. And so some sequences uh, look at different properties of the brain. And there are some newer sequences that have been developed which are more sensitive for brain injury than conventional MRIs. And so one of the newer MRI sequences which have been developed is something called uh, quantitative volumetrics. And quantitative volumetrics it allows one to get a detailed structural image of the brain, but it has very high resolution. It's like a, it's like a UHD picture versus a high definition versus a standard definition picture. And this allows you then to then uh, use a computer algorithm to accurately measure the volume of different parts of the brain, like the pallidum or the amygdala or the hippocampus. And then you can then quantify the volume of those structures, and then you can compare the volume of that structure in a patient with a normative data set to, to determine if there are abnormalities. And so this is a, a newer MRI sequence. Uh, it uses a tool that has been FDA approved, something by a company called Cortex, and this is kind of like a brain ruler, if you will. And the second kind of MRI scan that is a relatively newer sequence now I'll be talking about something called MRI DTI scan. DTI scan stands for Diffusion Tensor Imaging. And DTI scans look at the cabling or wiring that connects different parts of the brain to each other. So for example, the brain has a lot of wires or cables, if you will, that connect the right side of the brain to the left side of the brain, uh, and the front of the brain to the back of the brain the top of the brain to the bottom of the brain, the brain to the spinal cord. And so we're able to look at this wiring by looking at the axons. The axons are these long cables that connect neurons to each other. 
and these axons have water flowing inside. And we were able to look at the diffusion of water molecules inside these axons or cables and see if the diffusion of water molecules inside these axons or cables are disrupted. So uh, this would be like taking a straw and then looking at a drop of food dye in a straw and then you put that drop of food dye in a straw and in an intact straw the drop of food dye will stay inside the straw. But if the straw has, is torn or has a lot of holes in it, when you put that drop of food dye in a straw, you'll start to see the food dye leaking out through the holes or tears in the straw. So that's what diffusion tensor imaging does, that we're looking at the diffusion of water molecules in the axons or straws that connect different parts of the brain to each other to see if there is leakage or diffusion of the water molecules outside of the axons or straw. And so this is a, there, there have been a, a couple hundred articles that have been published showing that diffusion tensor imaging is a newer MRI sequence which is very good at detecting uh, uh, and what we call axon damage or shearing uh, in traumatic brain injury. So those are the three different kinds of scans I'll be talking about. The PET scan, which looks at sugar metabolism, the MRI quantitative volumetrics, and the MRI diffusion tensor imaging. Uh, was there a point in time that you became involved in this case, State of Florida versus Granville, Rich? I think it was about six months ago. Okay. And uh, uh, can you... And you tell the jury, what is it that you were asked to do regarding this case? Well, I was as, asked to uh, review a PET scan that was acquired on Mr. Granville Ritchie and also review an MRI DTI scan that was acquired on Mr. Granville Ritchie and an MRI quantitative volumetric scan on uh, Mr. Granville Ritchie to determine if there were any abnormalities. These tests of Mr. Ritchie, were they provided to you in, in California? Yes, they were shipped out to me on a CD in, in California. Okay. And um, as a re can you tell the jury, uh, uh, when you got these test results, what is it that you did and, and tell the jury what uh, you determined? Well, when I get the, the, the PET scan and the MRI DTI scan, uh, results uh, and the quantitative volumetric results. Uh, my specialty is in statistical image analysis. And so, uh, for example, with uh, the PET scan, basically I have software that is very widely used. Uh, 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 there have been probably thousands of paper using this software called SPM. And so this has been used for decades now, and it is uh, uh, the, used to analyze brain images. And so the way uh, this program works is that it takes, the, for example, the PET scan, and it slices the PET scan brain into different slices, and then it takes each slice and then will slice those into what we call voxels. Now, voxels are the equivalent of pixels. Now, if you look at a picture, a picture will have a resolution. Like, a, like the early pictures had a resolution of, say, like 640 pixels by 480 pixels. That meant there were 640 uh, columns and 480 rows. And so, yeah, and so each one of those would be a pixel element. And so we do something similar with a brain slice. We slice the brain slice into rows and columns in each slice, and then we look at each slice. And, and, but instead of calling these called a pixel, we call these a voxel, a volume element, because it's a three-dimensional thing. And, and what we do is we slice the brain up into a uh, 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 lot of voxel elements. And so we measure how much sugar, for example, is being consumed in each voxel element in the patient and we do the same thing with a group of normal controls. And then we calculate what is the average sugar consumption in a particular voxel in a particular area, and what is the standard deviation for that voxel in a particular area. And then we look at the, that corresponding voxel in a patient and determine is that voxel statistically different from the voxel in the normal control population. Uh, and so we, uh, we use a couple of different statistical thresholds to uh, determine whether the voxels are aberrant or not. And so uh, there's one we call a height threshold, 
which determines whether an individual voxel is abnormal, but there's something called an extent threshold, which is that you can't have just one or two individual voxels and call it abnormal. You have to have 30 of them clustered together. And when you have 30 of these clustered together, then uh, you say, well, it's not just random noise. It means that there's something real there. And so I've done sensitivity and specificity studies. These are statistical ways of determining whether these uh, dimensions are suitable for clinical use in discriminating, say, a brain injured patient from a normal control. And so the thresholds that I've chosen for what we call height and extent thresholds have been found to have high sensitivity and specificity for discriminating brain injured patients from normal controls. And then I create what we call a Z map. And so I have a PowerPoint to explain all these in pictures, but I'm just trying to give an overview of what I do statistically first. And then after we have these Z maps to show areas that are thresholded to show abnormalities, I then do what we call a region of interest analysis, where I measure that particular area in the patient and compare that area with the normal controls and calculate what's, how many standard deviations different and how uh, uh, these areas are. And so basically, I do statistical image analysis of PET scans, MRI, DTI scans, and quantitative volumetrics to determine if there are statistical abnormalities. So these are, are the way most radiologists typically read scans these days is that most radiologists don't do statistical image analysis. Most of them just eyeball the image, and that's fine for like looking at broken bones or things like that. But if you're looking at the brain, a statistical image analysis is a much more sensitive and accurate way of detecting abnormalities. Uh, now, some radiologists will have a very different opinion on this, and they will be vehement that statistical image analysis is uh, uh, you know, uh, something that they would not agree with clinically, but I think that there are thousands of scientific articles that use statistical image analysis, and I think that if you look at the peer-reviewed scientific literature, you'll find that scientists and clinicians who believe in peer-reviewed uh, uh, research uh, rely heavily on statistical image analysis to help us understand the brain. Now, you made reference to a PowerPoint presentation that you prepared, correct? Yes. And you, you, you've given the jury an overview of what you did, correct? That's correct, an overview of, of uh, my methodology, that's correct. Would the pre uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation allow you to be more specific as to what you did and what your findings were regarding the three tests that you conducted? Yes, it will be much more specific. With brain imaging, it helps to see pictures. <laughs> I mean, I can describe the imaging findings in words, but for the average a uh, non-physician, these words would be meaningless. Uh, and so it really helps to have pictures to try and explain what uh, I'm uh, describing. With the court's uh, permission, I would ask that you uh, position yourself in, in a way that you're able to uh, show the jury uh, what you did and, and what the uh, uh, slides reflect. Okay, let me set this up. <coughs> I can, but I, I would like to be able to like uh, circle around various aspects of the image, and so I, as I understand it, this touch screen allows me to circle various aspects of the of the image and and, and, and draw arrows to it, and I won't be able to do that from the witness stand. Mr. Uh, Harmon, what's your position on this? Judge, I have no objection if uh, Dr. Wu wants to testify mm -hmm. here. I just the jurors have a hard time hearing, they just let us know. And, and Judge, I'll step aside okay. while this is going on. 
chair. Yeah, and Your Honor, I would object to a narrative. Yeah, I we need to have questions. This needs to be an examination. So you need to ask him a question. He needs to answer it. So it can't just be a speech. Doctor, well, doctor I kind of want to block the jury. But, uh, <laughs> doctor, if you can answer questions from here. Um, what does this slide reflect as far as your beginning to explain to the jury what you actually conducted? So this is my uh, kind of uh, bottom line of what I found, and that is that uh, I did three different types of imaging, uh, MRI, DTI, a PET scan, and a quantitative biometric scan, and that these show significant abnormalities consistent with traumatic brain injury and someone who is at high risk of uh, what we call chronic traumatic encephalopathy and non-convulsive seizure disorders. Now, chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a term that many of you may or may not have heard of. It's a term that has gotten some more media attention because of the recent NFL class action lawsuits in which uh, uh, thousands of football players have alleged that they have developed CTE as a result of multiple subconcussive blows during their career in playing football and there have been other lawsuits not only in Okay, I feel like we're just having a speech. So we need to we need to tighten this up. We need to ask the question, he needs to answer the question, and then you need to ask the next question. Uh, you're explaining what that is, CTE. Uh, did you find that condition uh, in, in your analysis, did you find that condition with respect to Mr. Rich? Well, CTE can only be made uh, definitively upon death, but there are certain imaging findings that I found will be consistent with someone who would be at high risk for being diagnosed with CTE. And you also make reference to non-convulsive uh, seizure disorder. Could you tell the jury what that is? Well, a non-convulsive seizure disorder are seizure disorders that don't have the classic convulsions. Uh, these are seizure disorders in the emotional circuits of the brain. And, uh, and these occur after traumatic brain injury. And there are markers on brain imaging that are consistent with this kind of seizure disorder. And did you, based on your analysis of the test results, did you find evidence that Mr. Ritchie was suffering from non-convulsive seizure disorder. Well, he has evidence uh, on the brain imaging that are consistent with non-convulsive seizure disorders, and he actually has some symptoms that uh, are consistent with non-convulsive seizure disorders, uh, uh, which include, uh, so non-convulsive seizure disorders have certain symptoms. And some of these symptoms include, for example, like the sensation of insects quite under your skin. And, uh, and so this is like a, a classic symptom of someone with a non-convulsive seizure disorder. And so he has this kind of symptom. Uh, and other symptoms include things like a, a deja vu experience, feeling like you've been someplace you've never been before, that's a more common experience that some people have. But, but he has symptoms that are consistent with uh, non-convulsive seizure disorder. Let's go to your second slide. Uh, it, it refers to the MRI or the DTI, the diffusion tensor imaging. Uh, well, tell the jury what that is. Well, so uh, MRI diffusion tensor imaging allows us to assess, to assess the integrity of the white matter. So the brain is composed of two different types of matter. Gray matter, which are like the, the computer the, uh, of the brain, uh, and the white matter, which are like the cables that connect the brain. And so DTI are kind of like looking at the cable that connects the different parts of the computers in the brain, the neurons, to each other. Let's go to the next uh, slide. Uh, what does this slide reflect? So this is an article that talks about how in traumatic brain injury, there are oftentimes pathology, what we call the axons. The axons are these long cables that connect the neurons to each other, and DTI has been shown to be a uh, much more accurate way of detecting these kinds of injuries than conventional CT or conventional MRI scans. Go to the next slide. Now you've, uh, this slide refers to diffusion 
tensor imaging. Uh, tell the jury about that. Well, so in a uh, wide amount of fiber, the full water molecule is going to be in the direction of the fiber, and it's not going to be able to flow in a direction perpendicular to the fiber because it's going to be constrained by the axon. So, uh, uh, so that's basically what uh, this is saying. Now we see a, um, a diagram, if you could explain that to the jury. Okay, so, so this is what we call the axon. So the axon is this long tube here that connects a neuron here to other neurons. And so we're looking at the diffusion water molecule in this long tube here. This refers to traumatic, I'm not sure if I'm saying it correctly, axonal shearing injury. Uh, what does that mean? So in a traumatic brain injury, what happens is the axons can be torn or sheared. So here we're seeing this uh, uh, axon being uh, torn completely apart. Now, you can have tears that are not complete and are partial, so that the axon may still be hanging on by a sliver or thread. But uh, basically what we're seeing is a tearing of the axon. Now the axon is kind of like a straw, and so if you're looking at the diffusion of water molecule in that straw, okay. instead of being going in one direction up and down the length of the straw, it's going to start to leak out of the tears, and it's going to start to leak out this way, and compared to just going up and down this way. So did you notice that with respect to Mr. Richard? Yes, and so, uh, let's see. Uh, so, uh, I think I'll clear this chair. Okay, so uh, uh, I, I did, but uh, I can skip past this here. Uh, uh, it might be helpful we talk about this. Sure. Uh, what, this this um, image is fractional and is troppy, and I'm not sure, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing it, but tell the jury what that is. Okay, so, so in an intact straw, the water molecule is going to flow up and down the length of the straw. If the straw is damaged, then you're going to see water molecules leaking out and going in all directions, not just up and down the length of the straw. So this is a property which we call fractional and isotropy. Now, iso comes from the Greek word isosceles. So if you remember from basic high school geometry, an isosceles triangle had three equal signs, and iso means equal. And so iso means equal, and so if there is no uh, if there is uh, no uh, straw whatsoever, no axon, water is going to diffuse in what we call an isotropic manner. It's going to go equally in all different directions. But if there is a straw or axon, it's going to flow in what we call an anisotropic. An means not, not equal diffusion. And how does that relate to Mr. Rich? Well, we can characterize this numerically as a fraction. And so areas that have a more anisotropy are going to be characterized by a fraction like 1.0, and areas that have less fractional anisotropy will be characterized by a fraction that's lower. And so we can uh, look at Mr. Ritchie's uh, uh, values here. So for example, if we look at the uh, fractional anisotropy here, in a normal control average here, the value is 0.59. And in Mr. Ritchie, the value is 0.42. And we can look at the standard deviation, uh, which is a measure of the spread of uh, this. And so the standard deviation is 0.04. And so, uh, and so we know that 95% of the population will be within two standard deviations of the mean. And so if we have 0.59 plus or minus 0.4, 04 times 2. This would be 0.59 plus uh, uh, or minus 0.08, which would be 0 0.67 to 0 0.52. So we know that 95% of the population is going to be between 0.52 to 0.67. Now his value is 0.42, and this is about 4.4 standard deviations below the norm. So we can calculate what is the probability of this occurring by chance alone. So the odds this is occurring by chance alone will be 9.1 out of a million people. 
Now, normally, the threshold that is commonly used in medical tests to determine if it's something that's clinically uh, uh, worrisome would be if you're at uh, all five out of five out of a hundred. So the chance of this occurring uh, by chance alone is 9.1 out of a million. So this is well exceed the threshold. What what does what is that indicative of? Well, this is consistent with someone who's had a traumatic brain injury, which caused damage to this particular circuit. And so this would be consistent with someone who's had a significant traumatic brain injury. And this is very important, but you'll see that it's predominantly on the left side of the brain here. And this is tied in with what I'll be talking about later, because this ties in with Dr. Eisenstein's findings from yesterday. Dr. Eisenstein, now the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body, or what we call the dominant side of the body. Now Dr. Eisenstein found that there were uh, tests that showed that the dominant side of the body was more abnormal than the non-dominant, or left side of the body. And so he showed us on two different tests, the tactual performance test and the groove peg board test. And so this finding of this significant increase in fractional and isotropy in the left internal capsule is very consistent with someone who's had a significant traumatic brain injury in the past and is very consistent with Dr. Eisenstein's finding of significant abnormalities in the dominant hand on groove pegboard and the tactile performance test. So we have two independent testing modalities, neuropsychological testing and neuroimaging, which both independently implicate damage to the left side of the brain, from, uh, which, and both are consistent with a traumatic brain injury from the past. And so this is uh, a very significant finding that uh, uh, I see in Mr. Uh, Randall Ritchie. What other uh, images do you have dealing with the uh, test that you test results that you analyzed? Okay. Well, let's see. So besides the DTI, uh, we have the PET scan here, and uh, let's see here. And so, uh, again, tell the jury what a PET scan is. Okay. So so this is an example of a PET scan uh, from a normal control and a typical MRI scan. And so the, uh, this is a normal PET scan. And so what we're seeing here is that the areas that are red in color are areas that are higher in sugar metabolism, and areas that are blue are lower in sugar metabolism, and it goes red, uh, uh, red, yellow, green, violet, blue. And so uh, yellow will be a little less high than red, and green will be in the middle, and blue will be at the lowest here. And, uh, uh, and so this is well, what, what, okay, the next image indicates positron, which is e equals uh, positive electron. What is, what is that and what is the significance of that relating to this case? Well, the, so the technique we use is called a positron emission tomography. So what is a positron? A positron is a positive electron. Now, electrons in our universe are normally negatively charged. But we can create what we call an antimatter version of an electron called a positron. Now, uh, the advantage of creating antimatter is that when you combine antimatter and matter, you get the release of a tremendous amount of energy using Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, where E equals energy and m equals mass. And so the mass of the positron and electron are converted into pure energy. And if you're familiar with science fiction shows like Star Trek, you'll remember that the USS Enterprise is powered by a matter-antimatter engine. Well, that show was science fiction. The basic physics uh, principle that the combination of matter and antimatter creates tremendous energy is, in fact, a very well-accepted physics principle. And it's a fundamental physics principle that underlies a PET scan. Now we have uh, a machine of some sort. Can you tell the jury what that is? So this is how we create a positron. So this is a device called a cyclotron. And what is what is a cyclotron? So this is a schematic of a cyclotron. A cyclotron is two powerful triangular magnets which take charged subatomic particles and accelerate it it's in a series of cycles so that it's kind of like a merry-go-round. It keeps slapping and it keeps like a merry-go-round and the merry-go-round goes faster and faster. So with each revolution, as the particle is charged or repelled by the, uh, the magnet, the charged subatomic particle gets faster and faster. 
that by the time it emerges from a cyclotron and strikes the target, it's running at 99.9% of speed of light, which is 186,000 miles a second. And you need that kind of velocity to strike the target to create something which doesn't normally e exist in our universe, a positron emitter. Uh, the next image that you have says radiochemist attaches to sugar. Please explain what that uh, represents. So once we create the positron emitter with a cyclotron, we then take the positron emitter and attach it to the sugar molecule. Sugar is the main fuel for the brain. Uh, we now have a photograph of a gentleman. Can you tell the jury what, who it is and what it is and how it relates to Mr. Richard? So this gentleman is a radiochemist, and he's taking a positron emitter that was created by a cyclotron and attached it to a sugar molecule inside this hot cell. And he has to, this hot cell has a two inch thick leaded glass window which shields him from the radiation for the positron emitter. And he then, uh, uh, the next image says intravenous line. Please explain how that relates. So then once a radiochemist attaches a positron emitter from the cyclotron to a sugar molecule, we then attach an intravenous line into the patient. And then we inject the uh, radioactive sugar into the patient and then we place the patient in a scanner. The next uh, image says positron annihilation. Please explain. So the positron from the sugar molecule is denoted by the E plus, and it will combine with an electron in the ring called E minus. And, and just for the record, I, I think I, it's how do you pronounce that? Oh, an annihilation. An 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 yeah. Annihilation. Uh, annihilation. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I may have misspelled it, but let's see. But okay. here, here's the E plus here, and the, the positron combined with an E minus, the electron. And then <coughs> the electron and positrons are transformed using Einstein's equation, E equals MC squared, into energy rays. The energy rays come off at 180 degree angles. Sir, here. can you slow down just a little bit? Sorry. <laughs> okay. The energy rays come off at 180 degree angles here, and they are detected by these crystal detectors here. Uh, we now have a chart. Can you explain what that means? So the way the PET, PET scanner works is that we have thousands of crystal detectors that are built into the machine. And they detect when two simultaneous energy rays come off and strike the uh, crystal detectors. And they have something called a built-in coincidence circuit, which notes the simultaneity of the registration of the crystals. And the computer that will draw a line between these two crystals and then when another positron annihilation event occurs and, and the mass is converted to energy rays, you will have another pair of crystals that will be detected. And so the computer will draw millions of these lines that connect these pairs of crystals. And essentially we're looking at the intersection of these lines. The areas where there's a lot of sugar are going to have a lot of intersections and areas that will have, and will be colored red, and areas that have a uh, few uh, uh, intersections will be colored blue. Uh, the next uh, image, it has two, obviously two images. One um, uh, indicates Alzheimer's disease and the other indicates normal control. Explain that. And so PET scans are used now. They are covered by Medicare, for example, for the of Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that in an Alzheimer's disease patient, uh, that there is less red in this area compared to an HMAS normal control. And so this is not junk science. This is something that is clinically used for things like uh, detection of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, please explain the next, uh, the next image. So this is a three-dimensionally rendered view. And so what uh, this has done is it's taken individual slices and stacked them up to create a three-dimensionally rendered view of the brain. And this area here shows more blue compared to this area here. Uh, so this is a, how pets can be used clinically, uh, among other ways that pets can be used clinically. Uh, the next image indicates use of PET scan to evaluate mild traumatic brain injury um, taught in other major textbooks. Explain so, that. So some people, some radiologists would say, oh, no one uses PET scans to evaluate traumatic brain injury. Well, that's not true. There are major textbooks that have been published. For example, this is Functional Cerebral Spec and PET Imaging, now in its fourth edition, which talks about the use of PET scans to evaluate mild head trauma. But even though there are some radiologists who was vehemently say, oh, no one uses PET scans to evaluate mild head trauma. I mean, you know, this is clearly not true because there are, are textbooks 
that are now in the third and fourth edition that state this. And, and so I just want to uh, indicate that uh, although some of you are very firm in their opinion that this is not something that's used, they are clearly mistaken. Uh, the next image indicates statistical parametric Z maps are objective and more sensitive. What is explain that, please? Well, there are some unions who would dispute the use of statistical parametric Z maps. They say, "Oh, this is all junk methodology. These are all lies." And uh, and but I but there are textbooks that have been published that indicate that SPM, the methodology that I use, has been used to provide an objective method for examining FTG uh, PET data. It's visual analysis, the way most results commonly review PET scans, may not be sufficient to uncover metabolic disruption. And so although some results will say, oh, SPM is you know, <laughs> something that no one uses. You know, this is clearly not true. There are major textbooks that have been published they use SPN, uh, and so I'm just uh, point out that, that this is not junk science, and, uh, and, and even though some of you have a very vehement opinion about this, that, that there are, are peer-reviewed textbooks that have been published using this traumatic brain injury and using this type of statistical methodology. Uh, please explain the next uh, image, or the, yes, the next uh well, and I think the statistical analysis is especially important in forensic cases because they provide a way of provide objective, quantifiable ways of assessing uh, imaging data. So it's not just uh, eyeballing a scan and saying, oh, this looks normal to me. Uh, uh, you know, this uh, provides a way of providing a statistical and objective way. So uh, if you can have two radiologists who eyeball him, they, may, they both have a different opinion subjectively. But if you measure it, and can quantify it, then you're moving just beyond one uh, uh, radiologist's subjective opinion. And so Let me ask you, you yeah. know, I've asked you about being a neuropsychiatrist, are you also a radiologist? I am not a radiologist. Okay, okay. go ahead. What is the next uh, diagram? So this is Richie, uh, this is your Granville Richie's PET scan, and so he shows uh, significant abnormalities, which uh, I will go into detail in, but uh, basically he shows a, uh, uh, what we call a decrease in the ratio of the neocortex to the cerebellum here. So there is a particular ratio between the neocortex and the cerebellum, where the neocortex, the thinking part of the brain, is generally uh, much hotter than the cerebellum, which is in the back of the brain here. And in individuals who have had traumatic brain injuries, this neocortex becomes diffusely damaged, and so the ratio where the neocortex is in the numerator and the cerebellum is in the denominator, that fraction is going to be lower. And so this is something that I've seen in other individuals with uh, multiple traumatic brain injuries, and this is something that I have observed in uh, Mr. Van Ritchie. And now, are these... Um, uh, Headshots or whatever, uh, or brain images, uh, are they of Mr. Richie? <coughs> yes, these are Mr. Richie. Okay. Okay. And so, and, and then he also shows an abnormal increase in these areas of the brain called a striatum, uh, and he shows areas of abnormal increase in the areas of the brain called a cingulate areas here. And uh, now, uh, what is the significance of that? Well, these are areas of the brain that can become abnormally hot when you have a kind of uh, non convulsive seizure disorder, uh, and which can occur after traumatic brain injury. Is that consistent with the other findings that you've made? Yes, it's consistent. And, and uh, let's see here. And so, uh, <clears throat> now. What is the second uh, uh, image in there? So, this is what we call a Z map. Now, there are two types of Z maps that can be done. The first Z-map is with a significant negatives, which didn't sh uh, show much, but the second Z-map with significant positives showed a lot. And so, uh, and so th these black areas are areas that were statistically different in Mr. Granville Ritchie compared to uh, normal controls. And, uh, and so the black areas here show that the cerebellum is higher in Ritchie compared to normal controls. Now you only see this when this cortex is relatively low compared to the cerebellum. Uh, whereas, uh, and, and what's happening is that not the cerebellum is actually getting hotter, it's just that when the cerebellum is a small part of the brain and it remains normal, but the rest of the brain is getting colder, 
Then, relatively speaking, it appears hotter, which is why it shows up this way. And then we're seeing these areas here, the formal frontal cortex, the striatum, the cingulate, all these areas are showing up as statistical abnormalities uh, in Mr. Ritchie. And what is this image? So this is uh, measuring the cerebellum. And so we can see that the cerebellum in Mr. Ritchie, in a normal cerebellum, the average value is 0 0.93. And in Mr. Ritchie, his cerebellum value is 1.20. And so this is about 2.6 standard deviations above the norm, which would occur in roughly 9.4 out of uh, 1,000 individuals. Or, or, uh, and, so, uh, and, uh, and so this is consistent with someone who has had diffuse damage to the neocortex uh, 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 with a cerebellum uh, appearing to be hotter because it's smaller and it's intact. Now, and we have another image. What is that? So this is a striatum. And so here, and, and what is the striatum? The striatum is kind of like a switchboard of the brain. And so if you remember in the old days, you used to have operators who operate switchboards. And so someone in neighborhood A would call an operator, and the operator would uh, pass that person in neighborhood A by a switchboard to someone who they want to call in neighborhood B. And so the striatum type acts like a switchboard for the brain. It connects different parts of the brain to each other. And what does that image uh, represent or reflect? And so what we're seeing in Mr. Ritchie is that he has an abnormal increase in metabolism in striatum. So normal control value is 1.38, and Mr. Ritchie's value is 1.68, and so he's about almost three standard deviations above the norm, which is occurred at 4.6 out of 1,000 individuals. And this is something that we see in individuals who uh, have a kind of seizure disorder, which is causing some kind of activation of uh, uh, nodes that are connected to, to this area again. So this is consistent with a non thrombosis seizure disorder secondary to a traumatic brain injury. What is this image for, uh, So this is the area of the brain called the cingulate. The cingulate is a part of what we call the emotional circuit of the brain. So the brain has something called the limbic system. The limbic system is an emotional circuit of the brain that regulates fear, aggression, sex, and so this area of the brain is abnormally hot in Mr. Ritchie. It's again something that we see in some types of seizure disorders. And uh, what we're seeing here is that uh, uh, the normal control average is 1.41. His value is 1.63. It's about over two standard deviations above the norm. This, is, this would occur at four out of 100 individuals. And what does that reflect? This is also another area of the cingulate. So we're seeing multiple parts of the cingulate that are showing an abnormal activation. And that one? And this is uh, the inferior temporal gyrus here. And so this is the area of the brain that's... Uh, please, yeah, I'm sorry. Please tell the jury what that means. Mm -hmm. Oh, the inferior temporal gyrus is, again, part of the uh, limbic system of the brain. Uh, and uh, uh, this also shows an abnormal increase. Uh, consistent with temporal lobe epilepsy. And this image? And so this image is looking at the ratio of the neocortex to the cerebellum here. And so we're seeing here that uh, the uh, neocortex to the cerebellum ratio in, in Granville, uh, his neocortex, the denominator, uh, would be 0.98 divided by 1.09, cerebellum. So that would result in a ratio of 0.90. Whereas in normals, the neocortex is 0.99 divided by 0.96, which would result in a ratio of 1.03. And so we're seeing that his neocortex is lower than the cerebellum, whereas in normals, the neocortex is higher than the cerebellum. So this is something that we've seen individuals who sustain what we call diffuse damage to the neocortex. And so this is a statistically significant uh, decrease in, in, in him and something that I've seen in individuals who will be at high risk for chronic traumatic encephalopathy, like uh, uh, ex-NFL football players or people with multiple concussions. And, and what you're describing is, is, is what you're seeing regarding Mr. Ritchie's yeah, so brain. Yeah, so this is Mr. Ritchie's brain, but it will be similar to other patients I've seen who have uh, history of put them at high risk for CTE. Uh, what is what is this uh, reflect? This is a uh, something prepared by yourself. Yes. Yeah, so, so we talked about the diffusion tensor imaging scan, which looks at the cabling of the brain. We've talked about the PET scan, which looks at the uh, sugar metabolism, which reflects the neuronal firing, like the gas burning in the in the brain. 
Now we're going to talk about the third type of imaging, which is quantitative biometrics. And so uh, I think it's easy if I just reference the table, because I think these uh, words are just going to overwhelm the majority here. But, but basically, what we're seeing here is this area of the brain here is pallidum. And, and so... Um, and and tell, tell the jury, if you would, what a pallidum, what, what does it mean? Well, the pallidum is also part of the switchboard of the brain. So I was talking about the, the switchboard of the brain earlier. With uh, So it's another part of that switchboard of the brain. Uh, and which connects different parts of the brain together. And we're seeing that his pallidal value is, uh, is somewhere between three to four standard deviations lower than normal. And so, for example, uh, the normal control would have a left pallidal value of 1.06 cubic milliliters. He had the value of 0.47, which is about 3.55 standard deviations below the norm, which would occur in 3.8 out of 10,000 individuals. And the, and the right pallidum, he has a value of 0 0.57 cubic milliliters, and the normal controls have a value of 1.13 cubic milliliters. So this is about uh, 2.93 standard deviation below normal, which would be about 3.4 out of 1,000. And so this is something that is seen in traumatic brain injury. This is not something that he can fake. He cannot malinger a significant decrease in the bilateral pallidum. This is something that is quantifiable, verifiable. Anyone who measures these and has one control group can replicate this. And again, now there are some doctors who will say, oh, all this quantitative body metrics is, uh, you know, uh, something I don't believe in. I have no one uses this. That's not true. This is an FDA approved brain ruler. This is something that you can use that the FDA approved for measuring brain volume. And so it's very consistent with the other findings that I see in the PET scan, which shows the abnormal increases in various areas, like a, uh, a secondary to, which is, uh, like a secondary with a uh, non normal seizure is due to traumatic brain injury. It's very consistent with the DTI findings, like in the left internal capsule, with a decrease in FA. And we need to ask a question. What's your next question? Does, does that... Uh, that does, going back to the previous chart, <coughs> uh, and is it consistent with brain abnormality? Yes, it's consistent with the brain abnormality secondary to old traumatic brain injuries. Okay, go to the next step. Uh, uh, what is that? Well, so, uh, so there are peer-reviewed replicated literature which shows that the pallidum is decreased or atrophied in brain injury. And so here, this is uh, the globus pallidus, is another name for pallidum, and they're showing that there are significant decreases in this area after individuals with traumatic brain injuries. What is that? Well, this is another peer-reviewed replicated medical article which shows decreases in the pallidum by traumatic brain injury associated with deficits on neuropsychological testing. And this is something that Dr. Einstein reported yesterday, that he shows deficit on various aspects of neuropsychological testing, like roof, pegboard, and uh, on tactile performance, which are consistent with old traumatic brain injuries. And so we're seeing a correlation between two different independent testing modalities, which both independently implicate uh, uh, findings consistent with old traumatic brain injuries. Uh, this chart, what does it uh, tell you? What, it, what does it represent? So this is another chart that looks at a way of trying to quantify the brain. So what we're looking at here is the measuring the left cerebellar cortex and the right cerebellar cortex here in normals and enriching. And you'll see that the difference between the left and the right is about 1,800 cubic milliliters. Now you'll see with the standard deviation it's about 1,900 cubic milliliters. Now you'll see in Ritchie, that the difference between his left and his right cerebral cortex is about 7,000 cubic milliliters, and so that's about 2.8 standard deviations difference. So this is something that would occur in 5.1 out of 1,000 individuals. And so this left cerebral cortex is smaller to an abnormal degree than the right side. So this is uh, and it's consistent with someone who sustained damage to the left side of the brain, causing the left cerebral cortex to shrink, which is something that we see. And so it's consistent with the left side of decrease in uh, FA on the internal capsule on the DTI. Uh, 
this chart indicates implications of decreased neocordial to cerebellar activity. What does that mean? Okay, so we were talking about how the whole neocortex is low compared to cerebellum. The neocortex includes the frontal cortex. What is that? Well, the frontal cortex is part of the neocortex and it's low also. And we know that the frontal cortex is very important in the regulation of aggression. So if the entire new cortex, including the frontal cortex, is low, uh, then uh, the frontal cortex, in some ways, kind of acts like uh, a circuit breaker or a brake uh, of a car. And so if the frontal cortex is damaged, your ability to uh, regulate impulses, to put a brake on impulses, is going to be impaired. And there's a substantial scientific literature on this. And was that damage that you're describing something that you found with respect to Mr. Rich? Yes, on the PET scan, the decreased neocortex to cerebral ratio is consistent with the frontal cortex being damaged and it's consistent with exactly a function deficit that were noted by Eisenstein, for example, on the Wisconsin car sort test, which is a classic frontal cortex test. And so uh, Mr. Ritchie did horrendous on the Wisconsin car sort test. Uh, which is the ability to use the frontal lobe to be able to figure out when rules are changing. And the way the Wisconsin partial test works is that you have a series of objects like a, uh, that are characterized by either color, number, or shape. And you have to figure out which rule the experimenter will want you to determine if these are acceptable, whether it's the color, or number, or shape. And then at some point, say, like the color, red, then the rule changes. And then the uh, uh, experimenter with computer say, well, I want the correct number to be the shape. And, and a, a normal person with an intact frontal cortex would say, oh, the old rule that red uh, was the color that the computer wanted no longer works. So let me try a different dimension, like shape or number. And then you, 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 you use the frontal cortex to figure this out. Well, he could not figure this out at all. And, and, and it's consistent with a uh, frontal cortex damage consistent with the neocortical D to cerebral ratio decrease and it's consistent sir, with sir, you can have to slow down. Sorry. It's consistent with the frontal lobe being impaired and the frontal lobe is very important for the regulation of impulses. Now you are not a psychologist that conducts psychological testing, correct? That's correct. Uh, but do you rely on those test results to uh, either to determine whether it's consistent with your own analysis. I rely heavily on neuropsychological testing to correlate neuropsychological testing deficits with imaging deficits to see is there a correlation? Do these things match? And they match like a hand in a glove. Okay. Please continue. What does that image reflect? Well, so how do we know that the frontal lobe is important for the regulation of aggression and impulse control? Well, we know this because of the famous Phineas Gage case. So Phineas Stage was a railroad worker whose job was to tamp explosives uh, into uh, a hole that was drilled into the rock uh, to, in, when they were trying to build a transcontinental railroad. Well, while he was tamping explosives into a hole, the explosives went off prematurely and it shot the tamping rod through his frontal cortex. Now, remarkably, he survived, but his personality changed dramatically. Before this accident, he was an extremely conscientious, mature, considerate, kind, friendly person. After this, he became very foul-mouthed, immature, aggressive, rude, impulsive. And so this was probably one of the very first papers in the area of neuropsychiatry which points out that a damaged frontal lobe can significantly neurologically impair your ability to regulate impulses. Um, this image reflects uh, or is titled Vietnam Head Injury Study. Please tell the jury what uh, that means and, and how it relates to Mr. Rich. Well, there are other studies besides the famous Phineas Gage case that indicate the frontal lobe as being important in the regulation of aggression. So, for example, there was a famous study that looked at Vietnam veterans who were damaged, and some of them were brain damage to the frontal cortex, and some of them were damaged in other parts of the brain. The ones who were damaged in the frontal cortex were more violent and the ones who are damaged to other parts of the brain. Again, it is showing that when you have damage to the frontal cortex, your ability to regulate aggressive impulses is going to be impaired. Uh, this image reflects frontal lobe damage increases risk of aggressive behavior. So this is the third kind of study. And so there, uh, I'm just giving you three examples of why the frontal lobe damage is so important and how neuropsychiatrists know that this plays a role. 
And this looks at stroke victims. And victims who have stroke in a frontal lobe are more uh, violent and impulsive than victims who have uh, strokes in other parts of the brain. So these are just uh, how neuropsychiatrists uh, know from literature that uh, intact frontal lobe is very important for the regulation of impulses and, and behavior. Um, this refers to, again, the CT count. Well, so uh, this kind of decrease in neocortical to cerebellar ratio is something I've observed in the Dr. Visit. Wu, slow down. Sorry, you are. <laughs> It's something that I have observed in other individuals who have had a history of multiple traumatic brain injuries or multiple subconcussive blows, such as ex NFL football players or individuals with multiple traumatic uh, brain injuries. And uh, there's been a lot. I'm, I'm getting a look from the court reporter, so if you could uh, slow down. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Okay. okay. So uh, there's been a lot of media attention on chronic traumatic encephalopathy because you have people like. Aaron Hernandez, who was a famous uh, uh, football player who went off and he had like a $40 million contract with a quarterback, or, or I, I'm not a football fan, so I'm not really sure if I have a position right, but uh, he then went off and inexplicably murdered some acquaintance of his for no good reason, and it turned out he had CTE. And there are other people who were uh, ex NFL football players, like a Joe Van Belger, who went off and killed his girlfriend and shot himself in the head in front of team officials, and turned out he had CTE. So uh, CTE is associated with a deterioration in brain function, <coughs> so that the, uh, the damage earlier can result in a greater impairment in impulse regulation in later life. And, uh, and we know that her early head injuries especially increase the likelihood of developing CTE. We know that football players who start playing football before the age of 12 are much more likely to develop CTE than football players who start playing football playing after the age of 12. Now, Mr. Ritchie has a history of being beaten on multiple occasions by his father from as early as he can remember to the age of 16. And these include, uh, and, 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 and I asked him if he was beaten on the head, he said that he wasn't sure he, that he may have been. But uh, this kind of physical abuse, uh, especially to a young boy growing up, uh, is also going to in, is significantly increase the likelihood of developing CTE, which will result in uh, midlife failure in the ability to regulate the impulse regulations. And uh, before you move on, um, you, you make reference to the fact that you spoke with Mr. Ritchie. Now, uh, again, I, just to refresh, you relied on Dr. Eisenstein to do all the psychological testing and interviewing, correct? That's right. But did you have occasion this morning to speak briefly to Mr. Uh, Ritchie? Yes or no? Yes, I did. And what was the purpose of, of requesting that? Well, because I, I, I knew that he was physically beaten by his father on multiple occasions, but I wasn't sure exactly from what age to what age. And so I wanted to uh, get this information uh, from him. And he said that he, he was beaten from as early as he can remember till the age of 16. And, and, that, uh, and he showed me marks on his back from being beaten with a, a, a cable tie or, or some other uh, belt, or, you know. And, uh, and so, and so, uh, uh, and, and so I, I wanted to ask him about uh, uh, being beaten as a young child, you know, because that increases the likelihood of developing CTE, where you can have a catastrophic midlife failure of impulse regulation. <laughs> And uh, I also wanted to ask him about whether he had symptoms consistent with a non convulsive seizure disorder. Did he provide you uh, information regarding symptoms that was consistent with what your uh, analysis is? Yeah, so, so I asked him, so, so he said, for example, there are certain symptoms that people with non convulsive seizure disorders uh, report. So for example, one uh, symptom that people report is that they have the sensation of insects flying under their skin. And I asked him, do you ever have this kind of symptom? And he said, yes, he does. And uh, I asked him, uh, uh, yeah, how often do you have this? He said, a, a couple times a month. And that, uh, and that this is something that he has, even when he's not, uh, he's had a history of drug abuse. And so there was a question, raised, well, is this something that could, could have occurred only during drug abuse? But he says, no, he's had these symptoms uh, <laughs> a couple times a month when he's not had drugs. And, and he has uh, had other symptoms, including sensations of deja vu. So deja vu is when you walk into someplace that you've never been before, but you feel like, oh, I know this place, but I, I could put no place. I've never been here before. 
And, and so this is very common in people with non-convulsive seizure disorders. I asked him about other symptoms, which uh, like an olfactory illusion, and he didn't say that he had olfactory illusion. So he's not responding yes to every question I ask him you know, about every symptom. He was uh, you know, saying yes to some things and other, other things, but, but the questions that he did respond yes to were you know, classic symptoms of non-convulsive seizure disorders uh, and consistent with uh, having a history of earlier, uh, 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 previous traumatic brain injury which results in non-convulsive seizures and consistent with abnormal on his PET scan. And, and were, so that were they not only consistent with your findings, but also with what you had from Dr. Eisenstein? Yes, they were very consistent with Dr. Eisenstein's neuropsychological testing deficit. And, uh, 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 yes. Okay, please continue. Uh, now we see another uh, image uh, titled CT pathologi Pathological Changes. Can you tell the jury what this reflects? So you'll see this kind of reddish area here. This reddish area indicates the presence of an abnormal protein called tau. Uh, and so tau is something that you see in people who've had, who are developing CTE. And so uh, and now this is something, so to make a definitive diagnosis of CTE, you can only do this on autopsy when you measure tau. And so I'm not saying that he has a definitive diagnosis, but I'm saying that he has a history consistent with someone who would be at high risk for CT, with this kind of abnormal tau protein accumulating in the brain, causing impairment in things like inhibition control and, 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 and aggression control. Please uh, explain this image, or this uh, diagram. Well, so Mr. Uh, Richie has an abnormal increase in the medial temporal lobe that I showed in the PET scan, consistent with a low-grade chronic non-convulsive ictal or seizure disorder. And we know that stress can cause non-convulsive seizure disorders to flare up, and that sometimes uh, uh, this can result in individuals who can act out in a horrendous manner, uh, and, and that's very uncharacteristic of them. Uh, and, so, uh, and, so, uh, and so that may be relevant in this case. Please explain this uh, uh, image. Okay, so, so, uh, so he, uh, Mr. Ritchie had multiple statistical imaging abnormalities on PET, on MRI, DTI, on quantitative biometrics, consistent with the history of multiple traumatic brain injuries and with early childhood physical abuse. And so, uh, uh, so he was physically beaten by his father on multiple occasions from the time he came in early. He can remember until he was 16. Uh, and then he also had a history at age 10 of falling and slipping and hitting his head on concrete and being unconscious. And he's been involved in three motor vehicle accidents at least. In 2009 in Texas, he lost control on ice with an unrestrained driver and his car was totaled. On February 14, 2011, his rear ended in Brandon, and the car was pushed forward 100 feet. And in Tampa in 2012, his car again was rear ended, his car was totaled in, on May 21st of 2012. He was given a diagnosis of whiplash. So we know that he's had, uh, uh, he was beaten uh, on multiple occasions growing up as a child, that he had uh, an early childhood slip and fall. And he's had three different motor vehicle accidents. Now, we know that individuals, especially if they have had one previous uh, uh, traumatic brain injury, are more susceptible and vulnerable to subsequent damage in later traumatic brain injuries. And so that we know that you become kind of like an eggshell, <laughs> so that if you had a previous injury, you're, you're more of an eggshell, so that a subsequent injury, even though it's not that big, uh, can cause much greater damage because of the prior uh, damages uh, cumulative effect, and so he's had uh, multiple occasions in which he's uh, uh, had uh, MBAs. So would it be accurate to say that one head trauma can cause brain injury, correct? That's correct. But would it also be accurate to say that one per uh, person has had multiple occasions to have some kind of head injury, you become more prone to suffering the effects of, of brain abnormalities? Yes, there's a cumulative neurological uh, damage that uh, uh, gets worse and worse with each subsequent uh, uh, car accident or each, uh, especially when it combines with uh, early childhood uh, physical abuse. Your Honor, may I ask before we move forward to what number slide that was, Dr. Uh, slide 6474. The one we were just on. Oh, yeah, so uh, slide 63 of uh, 74, that's right. Thank you. 
uh, please continue. What does this uh, indicate? Well, so, uh, so I looked for correlation between Dr. Eisenstein's neuropsychological testing and my imaging testing. And one of the things that Dr. Eisenstein reported was that processing speed was uh, he was in the fourth percentile. That's very consistent with what we see in TBI, traumatic brain injuries, that their processing speed drops, their ability to process information quickly slows down a lot. And, uh, but, uh, uh, and his processing speed, seen speed was 4 percentile, whereas his verbal comprehension score was 23rd percentile, and his working memory was 30th percentile. So, so this kind, uh, normally, in most individuals, you see a fairly similar correlation. If you're 30th percentile in one area, you tend to be 30th percentile in other areas. But you see these kind of what we call disparities, where one area is very low and the other areas are high in brain injuries. And so this is consistent with uh, uh, having a history of uh, traumatic brain injury. There's another significant difference between his immediate auditory memory of 50th percentile and his arithmetic ability of 7th percentile. And so these kinds of disparities uh, are, are common in traumatic brain injury, not common in the general population. What does this indicate? Well, so he showed impairment on executive function testing. And so on the tactile performance recognition test, he scored in a moderately impaired range on the right hand, which is controlled by the left side of the brain. And whereas the left hand was just mildly impaired. And it's consistent with this left-sided internal capsule or DTI. So this side is the left side of the brain. It's consistent with this kind of decrease in the DTI in the left side, which was 4.4 standard deviations below the norm. And, uh, uh, and it's also consistent uh, with the uh, uh, greater, uh, uh, with this left-sided decrease in the cerebellum. With this, the cerebellum is 60,758 versus 68,000. It's a difference of 7,300, which is uh, 2.8 standard deviations different. And so we have uh, this correlation between the, the uh, quantitative biometric and the DTI, both being consistent with Dr. Einstein's finding during the dominant hand, right hand controlled by the left side of the brain, is moderately impaired compared to the left side on the tactile performance test and also on the second test that Dr. Einstein did, the groove pegboard test, in which Mr. Ritchie did worse on the right hand than the left hand. And so we have two different neuropsychological tests, both showing greater impairment in the right hand and left hand. And we have these uh, imaging studies which show left side of the brain impairment on DTI, left side of decrease in, in the cerebral uh, volume. On, uh, so again, the psychological testing, is it consistent with the images that you're showing? It fits like a hand in a glove. This is clearly consistent with a happy history of multiple traumatic brain injuries. And it's really consistent with his history of having been beaten by his father from the at early from the age of 16, and then having been in multiple car accidents. What does that uh, like? Well, so on executive function, Dr. Einstein found that he was impaired on a Wisconsin car store test. And he was extremely impaired on the uh, Wisconsin car store test. Uh, most people, there are six different categories that you can get. And so most people can get you know, four, four, five, six. He got zero out of six categories, something like that. I mean, uh, as, as bad as you can get. Consistent with frontal damage. And this is consistent with a decrease in neocortical to cerebellar ratio that I found on a PET scan, which would include the frontal lobe. And, and are you also familiar with, uh, from reading uh, what Dr. Uh, Eisenstein had reported, that he performed several tests to determine whether the defendant was malingering or faking. Yeah, so Dr. Eisenstein performed several validity tests, including the test of memory malingering, among others, and he passed all of them as flying colors. Uh, and so there's no evidence that he was faking or malingering his neuropsychological performance, and there's no way you can malinger these kind of neuroimaging tests. You cannot selectively decrease your FA in your left internal capsule to uh, something like you know, uh, three out of a million. You cannot selectively decrease the volume of your cerebellar uh, cortex uh, on the left side compared to your right side. So, so there's no way you can malinger or fake those things. And so... Okay, how many more slides do we have left? I have, uh, I'm on slide 68 to 74, Your Honor. Okay. All right, do you all want to take a break now? Okay, very good. They want to keep going. Okay. What is this indicate? So Mr. Ritchie is scored uh, a, a moderately impaired on a trail B, which is a test of complex attention. Uh, and it's consistent with TBI. So it's consistent with the decreased neocortical cerebral ratio. It's consistent with all the other tests, including the decreased in palatal volume that uh, was on quantitative volumetrics. And this image. 
So, uh, so uh, Mr. Ritchie has had multiple brain pathologies which affect uh, behavior. He had uh, Amnox and DTI consistent with uh, TBI, uh, 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 decreased internal capsule F fractional anisotropy, uh, and also consistent with uh, someone who's at high risk for CTE. We had to see Amnox and PET consistent with multiple TBIs and uh, non convulsive or partial complex seizure disorder. And he has symptoms like uh, this a sensation of insects flying under his skin a couple times a month, consistent with uh, uh, sometimes uh, partial complex uh, non convulsive seizure disorder. He had abnormalities on his quantity body metrics, consistent with traumatic brain injuries, his decrease in the tallow volume, consistent with someone with old traumatic brain injuries. He has uh, psychiatric symptoms consistent with traumatic brain injury. So people who have had most traumatic brain injuries are at a lifetime higher risk of developing depression. Uh, and he has had struggled with depression. And so this is kind of, so his history of struggling with depression is consistent with someone who's had multiple traumatic brain injuries in, in his life and consistent with having been physically beaten by his father from as early as to the age of 16. We know that uh, having adverse childhood experiences like being beaten uh, by your father and, uh, for such a prolonged period of time also significantly increases risk of developing depression in later life and also significantly increases the likelihood of catastrophic failures of impulse regulation. So obviously, the, would it be correct to say that the beatings can <coughs> result in, in not only physical damage but also emotional and psychological damage? And neurological damage, yes. Uh, what does that represent? Well, we know that Mr. Ritchie uh, uh, grew up in an environment that had a lot of gang violence, where a lot of his friends and family were uh, 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 killed. And we know that growing up in a dangerous childhood environment is also increases the likelihood of having impulse regulation failure in later life. He actually has a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder from the loss of many relatives. He's actually been treated with Zoloft. Uh, since he's been incarcerated for his PTSD, so a lot of the antidepressant which is used to treat post-traumatic stress disorder. And then? And we know that uh, brain injuries can increase the risk of impulse disorders and mood disorders. And uh, but your brain you're much more likely to uh, not act out uh, in later life, uh, even if you grew up in a very abusive environment. But we know if you grew up in, a, in an abusive environment and your brain is damaged, that there's an interaction between growing up in an abusive environment and having a damaged brain, which makes it much more likely that you will have a catastrophic failure of impulse and aggressive regulation control. And, uh, and so Mr. Ritchie has both factors in spades. Uh, he has a history of growing up in an abusive environment where he was physically beaten by his father from as early as he can remember to the age of 16. He grew up in an environment with a lot of gang violence where a lot of his friends and family were killed. Judge, I'm going to object to the repetition. I just sustain the objection. So we, he keeps repeating himself. So we need to move along. Please continue. What does that reflect? Well, this is a, there's a, a significant scientific literature which indicates that there is a significant interaction which has been scientifically documented. That's the stressful experience of growing up in an abusive family or being victimized can be overcome uh, without the development of later violence by people with an intact central nervous system, but not by those who are neurologically impaired. That's it. I have a couple more questions, Doctor. If you could regain your seat. Obviously, you've explained it in the PowerPoint presentation, but as a result of your review of these test <coughs> records, are you able to render an opinion uh, within the bounds of reasonable medical certainty as to whether or not uh, Mr. Ritchie has brain abnormalities? Uh, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, uh, there is no question in my mind that Mr. Ritchie has multiple brain abnormalities that is evidence on multiple different types of brain imaging when using statistical image analysis. That's all I have. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it's 1040. We're going to take a quick five-minute comfort break, and then we will be back in uh, for the cross-examination of this witness. All right? See you there. All rise, jury exiting.